Um, I've been given a sort of somewhat provocative theme to talk about, and I guess the relationship between the um, city and the creative economy. So I'll try and pick up two or three themes and try and connect up stuff. Maybe for those of us who've been here over the afternoon, for me at least it's been quite interesting to look at the range of, of different ways of expression that we've seen, uh, you know, on, on, on the screen. Uh, but first, I guess, I mean, you know, if you see, in fact, I've been, I've been to Mumbai thrice in, in the last, let's say, four or five weeks, uh, which is a little bit surprising. I've spent a fair amount of time in the city and, you know, worked on it. I'm not really a scholar, but I've worked on the city and worked in the city. Um, the last, well, that image is gone, uh, but, uh, and sort of reflects the kind of things that are happening here. One was for a, for a, for a conversation, a very large meeting on green buildings, of which this is one in some senses, which is a big shift. Fifteen years ago, uh, we wouldn't have seen that kind of process. It seems to be something happening at least at the top end of the market in that there was a very large convening and we were trying to show people that it's something that actually works. The second uh, was an interesting experience, actually. It was a reflection, and we were in the Taj. Uh, it was a reflection on what we had learned from 2611. So I work on a whole range of things, but one of the questions that we work on is, is violence in the city. Uh, and it's interesting because that I saw that image of the Taj coming up there. Uh, in some senses, you know, it's, it's become a meme for some people in the city and others. It will not, but it was very interesting for us uh, at least for me personally, to actually meet some of the people who are critically involved in what happened in 2611 and to understand the nature of stuff that we don't see at all. And the reason I'm saying that is that there's, you know, at least in the imagination of some people in this country and outside, uh, Mumbai is associated with a certain representation of the country, whether it's Bollywood or whatever it is. I mean, you know, there's a certain representation that's there. And when you look at the relationship, and, you know, I talked to the people who are actually involved in the operations there, between the media and what is actually happening in every life, you start realizing, and it's, it's, it's very real, uh, of course, things have changed since then, but for India, in some senses, it was a coming, uh, you know, coming of age, because for the first time, we could see stuff happening live on television, almost in some senses. Uh, like in other parts of the world, I mean, you know, this is what happened in some senses in the 60s in the U.S. Uh, when the Vietnam War came right into people's houses and actually changed the consciousness of what happened in the U.S. Uh, you know, it really propelled the peace and civil rights movement in, in, in many ways. There were some connections between the two. So we're, we're, we're living in an age in which a lot of things that were not possible uh, or not imaginable 10, 15 years ago are, are becoming part of everybody's people's everyday lives. And let me give you a sense of what, what we're talking about. Because what did strike me with a number of the, uh, of the films that we saw today and the last discussion that we just heard about the Yamuna is the question of individual narratives in a larger picture uh, of homogenization. In fact, that's part of the challenge. There's a big drive uh, for a whole range of reasons to actually create these very strong, structured, uh, unitary narratives. But in actual fact, if you look at this country, 1.3 billion people at the moment going to 1.5. If you add other parts of South Asia, uh, if you add, you know, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, etc., we actually at about 1.8, 1.9 billion people. So if you think of it in, in those terms, which means that as a region, we have more people than in East Asia. We still think of us as, you know, of course, by 2025 or 2023, India it itself as a pol political entity will have a larger population than China, so we're the largest population in the world. So in some senses, you know, you have the opportunity to at least engage with billions of narratives. Now, when many of us who were born a long time back, we just had a few hundred million people, three, four hundred million people. We've seen, you know, two doublings since then. But the more important thing in some senses is, uh, you know, the people who were born in the 50s, 60s, whatever, even, even earlier than that, the, the, the kind of media that you had were essentially media that pushed things at you. So you had radio, and then, of course, you had television. But now, because of the internet, the interconnectivity that you have, you have, whatever, 1.3 billion people, of which five or 600 million people for the first time 
have access not only to information that comes onto their individual devices, but they have the ability to be able to share and exchange those experiences of their own otherwise. So the world has changed in a very dramatic way. So in some senses, both in terms of citizenship and in terms of creation, there's an immense space that's opened up. So at, at one end, that's an immense space that's opened up. You can literally, you know, I mean, whatever, with 4K video, which is going to be here like tomorrow morning when 5K, uh, I mean, 5G is in place and you have enough bandwidth to it. Pretty much every young person and everybody under the age of, let's say, 40 or 45 or so will, will have the ability and willingness to go out and, and, and speak about stuff. So at one end, you have the entire chaos that we're seeing in social media. Uh, and, and, and at the other end, you see a homogenizing uh, narrative that's built out using a whole range of different media and ways of doing things. Yeah? That's part of our political discourse and a whole range of other things. So there's, there's going to be a significant contest between that. And I think w one of the reasons why there's both self-censorship or a whole range of other challenges that we see uh, in our creative communities is because we don't actually have a strong enough vocabulary and enough practices to engage with these questions. And where is that most intense? That's most intense in our urban environments. Why? Because if you look at, look at the larger landscape, like I said, 1.3 billion people, but those 1.3 billion people live in about 650,000 places. Okay, so if you divide one by the other, the average number of people live in a place are actually not very large. However, however, uh, we have about a third of our population living in about 8,000 places, and those are towns, cities, and mega regions like Mumbai. Fine? So, you know, we have a lot of people who live in lots of places. That's what village India is about. In a sense, India's culture is, is situated and is, is very deep and rich and resilient because we have, whatever, a few thousand years of that culture. But we often forget uh, that we also have a deep and long cultural tradition around urbanism which is as long as pretty much every other culture, whether it's, you know, what is currently Iraq or what you see in East Asia with China or in Egypt and other places. So, you know, if you, if you had the opportunity to walk in the sewers like I have of Lothal and, you know, Dharo, Dola, Vira, or other places, you see that we have, a, we, have a, we have, it's not only imagination, it's a real culture. In fact, in many of these places, if you look at the current villages that are there today, and, I, you know, if you go to Dola, you can see it, the villagers today actually live in worse conditions than people lived in those urban environments 5,000 years ago. I'm not trying to romanticize where we were or how we were, but we have a long history of, of, urban, of urban culture. In fact, not only do we have a long history of urban culture, we have a long and very stable history of urban culture. So if you look at the places that have been, been, been urban for a long period of time, at least for over the last 2,000 years, there are about 1,000 places or so that have had a strong urban culture, places that you don't think about today, Ujjain, for example. Banaras, of course, everybody knows about. Uh, and, of course, they also know about because the Prime Minister comes from there, but that's a separate issue. Uh, so we have places that have a long history of urban culture and a very diverse history of urban culture, including in places that we don't think of, 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 of as, a, of, as a, of urban. Uh, and, you know, one thing that most people don't know is that in the, in the, uh, in the 18th century, India, Japan, and China had the largest proportion of urban populations in the world. Uh, we actually had a de-urbanization that happened in, in, in the 18th century uh, as part of the whole process of, of colonization uh, where people left urban areas partially because of economic and other reasons, etc., etc. So the fact is that we have a very diverse spread of, of, of people living in different places. Uh, we have cultures that relate to that, and you, know, and you can see that in our crafts and in the stuff that we wear and we talk and stuff like that. But in this, in, the, in this urban space, there's something that's changing very dramatically. And the thing that's changing very dramatically is the amount of economic activity and, and the amount of wealth that's being concentrated. Because urban areas do many things. They create places of opportunity. So that, you know, the most important opportunity that people in this country need, especially young people, is jobs. So they you know, give you the, the opportunity to work and, and be paid if you're working for somebody else, number one. The second thing is, because of that, you earn incomes if you're in some form of, of, of engagement economically. And that also helps you accumulate wealth. So what we've seen happening, especially in the last, I would say, 30 odd years, but more, more, more critically in the last 25, is a massive accumulation of economic output in incomes and wealth. 
And that's not many things, that's what the city is about, that's what this building is about in some senses. Uh, but it also, so it's given people opportunities to do a whole range of things. We're able to have these conversations because we have access to those circuits of, of circulation and, you know, value addition and stuff like that. But they've also created opportunities of inequality. Certainly in the, in, in the material condition. But because our devices and our connectivity has grown very much, somebody who in a different world, 20 or 30 years ago, from a particular, let's say, a social or economic background, would not have had the opportunity to see or question or experience how the difference is, sees it every day absolutely flat on in front of their face. So it's not only the question of, of the actual growth of inequality, which is, is a matter of some concern and it is growing quite strongly and is growing very strongly in our, in our urban areas, and we can see it in everything that we do, but also the fact that that inequality, the force of that in your face is becoming stronger and stronger. So it's very obvious then that a whole range of, of, of other uh, forms of engagement will emerge from that process. I'm, I'm just laying this out because one of the most important things that reinforces this process is the social construction of who we are and how we relate to each other. And the so-called creative industries are absolutely central in this myth-building process. And this myth-building process is absolutely central to what Indian cultures are about because we're essentially still an oral culture, irrespective of the fact that we have, you know, lots of people going to schools and colleges and, you know, we use all these fancy technology stuff just now. But we're fun fundamentally an oral culture still. We're making the transition. In fact, in some senses, because of the tech that we have, we may not even need to become literate and become oral again. Yeah, and that's, that, that's the interesting opportunity that we have today. So, so there's, there's this great and interesting opportunity of, of using orality and its, its diversity in some senses uh, to be able to, to, to create these narratives uh, which are quite different. So the tension in some senses is, especially as we sort of, we, we tend to embrace narrower views of, let's say, nationalism as one, 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 one particular challenge, uh, of trying to homogenize processes while the actual lived reality of people is actually to to be able to, you know, hear hundreds and thousands or maybe millions of voices that are there. So the challenge, I think, before the creative community is how do you embrace the plurality, how do you embrace the new technology, how do you embrace the opportunity of, of speaking the stuff that we saw today. We saw, you know, different stories. And I think what, what was very interesting for me was many of them, I mean, not this one. This one, to, to my senses, is, is interesting because it's a canonical description of Mumbai, it works quite well. For those of us who don't know the city, otherwise it tells you all the, you know, the great places that you spend time in and whatnot. But the actual life of the city is in the everyday life that we saw in, in that great film from Ahmedabad. The bulk of the people live like that. And many of us also do that. That's what real life is. Whether it's a cat or, you know, it's, it's the everyday cycle of, of living and the transition that you see from an earlier way of life into the so-called you know, the new PMAY modernity that has all the S SRA in Bombay, etc., etc. I mean, you know, that, that's the transition that most people experience. So, the, 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 in a sense, I think the challenge before us is first to think about, you know, what the economy is. And we have a very particular economy, and I'll come to that in a second. And the second, the second question that is, what are the creative elements of it? So, again, you know, the, the classical things are obviously... Yeah, whatever. Cinema is the most obvious thing that it comes to you, and then those of us who are tied to that, people in the arts, designers, and there's an increasing concentration of them, and, and a lot of younger people are actually sort of, you know, are gravitating into those spaces rather than the traditional old things where people would go in and do jobs for other people and become engineers and doctors and, you know, less interesting professions. But I think one of the things that some of us have been contesting for a while, and, you know, we did a piece of work for UNESCO about four or five years ago. I won't bore you with it very much, but what UNESCO has been trying to do, or at least the West has been trying to do, is to say that there is a new economy that's emerging, and that economy is what they call the creative economy. Um, and, you know, that's very productive, and the more of more, more artists and, you know, people who creative things that you have in a city, uh, the better the city is, is for the people. It attracts more interesting people, and you can see that in many places in the world. I mean, London is one example, uh, whatever. There are lots of other cities of that kind. So the, the, the discourse is that you have, if you have really creative people in various places, uh, they attract other people, it 
it makes for a different lifestyle. It makes for a much more holistic form of living. It's not only about, you know, a nice place to live with the nexus of water that we've seen in some places, uh, but also uh, a, a, about quality of life and, and enriching yourself through cultural and other diverse experiences. Now, I mean, you know, there was an attempt to try and do that for India, which I don't think is very useful because we have to probably unask that question. And that is to ask, you know, is it only the people in design, in fashion, in X and Y and Z are, who, are, who are actually creative? Or is, there, or is there a much wider base in this country that can actually be looked at? So to, to look at it in, in very concrete terms. Uh, we are still a country in which even though, let's say, um, machine-made clothes have become more important and some brands have become quite critical and, you know, we're doing quite well, we're exporting, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, in which a significant portion of people still stitch their own clothes or if they don't stitch it themselves, somebody else does it for them. So in, in some senses, bespoke tailoring, the darzi, so to speak, is a high art in OECD countries. Now, is that creative or not creative? And if it were creative, then how would you actually organize it and try and promote it? Because, you know, as we know, whether it's for footwear, for other, other things, if you look at the development of particular industries in the West, they've actually come from the guild and crafts traditions, they've been organized, industrialized, and then they've been taken forward into design. Can we use a different way of doing that? That's, so, I mean, instead of if you think of, of all people into, in, into fabric making and tailoring as, as different from, from textile workers or crafts workers as being part of the creative industry, uh, and, and actually build the linkages between what you do with them it completely changes your landscape of who is who and where creative industries are. Just in terms of the map, you know, there's a wonderful map that you people have done of cultural places in the city. So if you look at the places where, where really interesting stuff was happening in terms of clothing, uh, and clothing is very interesting because it's disruptive. The supply chains, as far as even the, the top brands in the world, go into all the informal settlements in this country because women in their households are actually doing the work and producing stuff that come out of, you know, all the... A, B, C, D's gap, et cetera, et cetera, that come out of that. So you, you can completely sort of reconceive that process. Also, so, something else that we experience very clearly. You know, we've all gone out, and one of the great attractions of coming here, especially from South Bombay, is because the food's really good. So one thing that really holds Indian cities and cultures together is the act of eating, and it changes from, you know, I've traveled and worked across the country, so literally from 30 or 40 kilometers to the other, things change. What you eat and what you don't eat is, is, is very different. So we're a culture that's strongly defined by 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 food and culinary processes and it's more than just just gastronomy it's also tied into ayurveda and health and a whole range of other things so it's it's a complex cultural process so the question i have for you is uh, instead of looking at five star michelin processes and stuff like that you I know mean, is is the art of food production or the you know vada vada pav is it a, is it something that you're going to look for a geographical indicator for right so if you look at people in food and, in, in, and, and food creation as part of the creative industry in some senses. And we can and tie that in and don't put everything into cans and into, you know, whatever it is uh, that go into supermarkets and stuff like that. Can we actually look at that as, as, as an opportunity to create value addition, to create employment? Because one of the big challenges that we have today is that we are a very sort of odd kind of an economy. So traditionally, if you take the route that China has take, taken, you have a large number of people in agriculture, which we still have. We still have half the people in the country who are employed there, two-thirds of the people who live in rural areas. You transition them in the, in, the, in, the, in the standard model of development, first into industries, exactly what China has done. They bought 10, 15 million people a year, usually split women and men separately, into large dormitories and factories, and they've become the factory of the world in some senses. They have, for the last 30 years, grown at you know 10 percent per year they move the largest number of people out of poverty through the process of industrialization and urbanization at the same time a remarkable story in some senses but with a lot of unintended consequences we have not been like that for the last 40 years or so our lead economic sector is what we call services which basically means everything else it's everything from the chaiwala who we saw uh, to you know somebody who's working in high tech animation industry. It's everybody. So we have been a services sector-led economy, but we've been trying to ape the Western way of doing services. So I think one of the questions that we're trying to unask is, if we can look at a whole range of these processes, which are largely informal, and that's what distinguishes us here. 
they, they, they're not only different and they're culturally based, like food or clothes or, you know, most of the stuff that, that, that are, are many things that are part of our, of our everyday life. Or music, which is pretty obvious in some senses. Uh, they're culturally based, they've got deep roots that go back to the classical traditions in some cases and also the folk. So we have a lot of things to, to draw from. Uh, they're also connected between rural and urban areas. You still find, you know, places like Hubli Darbar, for example, which is not a very large space in some senses, which is a great space for a whole range of creative processes. And you, you find two dozen of them across the country, which you'll never find in any other, in any, any other part of the world. So can we use that as a rubric to actually create the opportunity for young people to find work in? Which means that we, we, we you know, of course, we need to do all the stuff that you need to do, high-end design to do whatever, 3D printing and fancy cars and what, aircraft and all that kind of stuff. You know, we have to do all of those things also. But we have a very interesting opportunity here to reconsider and reimagine the nature of work. So it's not only people who are rich and who can go to design school and to whatever, to a music school or who can afford to spend 10 years uh, as part of the Guru Shishya Parampara to learn how to, you know, to, to play music or sing or whatever it is, who have access to creative activity, but also actually enable that for a wider range of people. We haven't thought about this question, but what struck us when we were looking at this is that there's a great opportunity to do that, but that is tied into the nature and the culture of the city. So what do you need to make that happen? You obviously need opportunities for that in your education. So if your school education sort of destroys all of that culture and chucks it out and puts it out into, you know, socially acceptable work or um, curricular stuff, it doesn't work. So you really need to bring the culture of the house and the school together, which is something that we've been successful in erasing s remarkably well in the last, whatever, 50 years or more. You've got to start with that. The second thing is, you have to have places in the city, which are not only subaltern places, where people who, you know, come from particular castes and communities and traditional cultural sort of uh, processes actually transact that. So you have to enable other people to be able to engage with that and actually work around it. And we have technology to be able to make that possible today. You can find the places, you can create new spaces. You know, our cities are very ephemeral, they change, they modify themselves, etc. So we need to create the spaces inside the city for that to happen. They're happening in any case. I mean, you know, in any systematic study of, of Bollywood gives you many, many layers of different kinds of employment, all the way from the stars right down to you know, the entire industries that support that, there are lacks of people who are involved in that with different levels of informality. But I, what I'm saying is that we have to think of, of things in other ways. And, and what, what constitutes a challenge for us, as far as informality is concerned, is precisely the problem that we've always had with our artisans. So for India for 1500 years, uh, was a leader in textile production across the world. In fact, the big challenge that we faced in the 17th and 18th century was the fact that they were just like Trump is doing just now, there were massive tariff barriers to make sure that our textiles wouldn't go into the West because they were very, very competitive and would wipe out those industries that were starting to develop and copy the things that we had with new technology, right? But most of that was based on artisanal production. So transmission and of knowledge happened from generation to generation, usually within a caste or a kin group. Uh, there was limited development of the technology. Why? Because the people who were producing those things didn't have the resources to experiment and adapt and do all the fancy things that we can do today. You can go to YouTube and see how to change your screw or do X and Y and Z, and everybody can do that. Uh, but there has to be a systematic way of doing this. So there were no innovation systems. So the innovation systems moved very slowly, but it was a world that moved very slowly. Today, the innovation cycles work, work in, in most places in industrial systems over months and days, and it doesn't take like decades for that to happen. Obviously, some things that are slow, that require high art, will require that time to happen. But to link it in with everyday work means that you have to connect those cycles up and make that possible to work. And we don't have the way of doing that because we're not able to bring people who are actually doing this stuff together to experiment. And there are no spaces to fail and to test. So most of the entrepreneurship that you have, it doesn't exist because you're doing piecework. Yeah, like, it's like the garment industry. You're doing piecework every day. So what will you do? And how will that trickle back into the, to the designer? So we really need to try and think about new ways of doing this stuff. Uh, and, you know, there are enough spaces in, in our large metropolitan cities, certainly, and in other areas to actually try this and test this out and do this differently. And the reason that I'm, I'm, I'm sort of provoking you to do that is the cheapest and most efficient way to test this out 
is really in the digital media and arts. It doesn't take anything to do it. You need access to a laptop. If you don't have it, you can go to a near, near cyber cafe. Somebody has, you know, software which they may not necessarily own that you can use. So, you, you know, pretty much anybody who can, who can use a phone today can actually become a digital artist. And they can learn most of the arts that they have, which is off the, off the web or through their networks and a whole range of other processes. So this is a very low entry barrier industry in some senses. You know, whether it's game making, gamification at one end or otherwise. And we have people who are not only creative, but are smart and now have access to a lot of this stuff in all the languages that are not taught in the West. So if you look at the growth of, of the language internet in India, it's phenomenal, just like the language press in the country. So I think we are, many of us, because we come from certain ways of thinking, certain classes and certain, you know, forms of formal education, do not see there's a tremendous amount of opportunity and talent and economic activity that's building without actually seeing it. The challenge is how to aggregate it, how to make it sort of economically more, more active and how to make that chain of innovation work most effectively. So my provocation in the sense to the people in the room who are doing this kind of stuff is, you know, obviously you can do the same thing for, 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 for culinary stuff and other things. There are a few areas that we can really test and, and check this out. It doesn't require very much. It doesn't require very much. You just need spaces where people can sit and meet and do, do various other things. So the equivalent of what we saw uh, in, you know, in, in great centers of innovation in the last 30, 40 years, whether it's, uh, you know, Silicon Valley and all the stuff that happened outside Stanford, all the stuff that is happening in other places, it's easy for us to create it. It's waiting for that to happen. The only thing is we are captured by an imagination at one end of very organized, big ticket kind of stuff, which is what it is. If you've got to make a $100 million you know, uh, budget film, which is going to bust the box, box off it with a billion dollar, whatever it is, you need to do what you, you need to as far as that's concerned. But if you're doing something at 1,000th the scale, you don't need that stuff. And that, I think, is the opportunity that we have in our, in our, in our uh, urban context. So it's a connection between the cultures that we have, and that's our, our resource in some senses, which is still alive, and the people who carry that. So in that, in that sense, you have a wonderful opportunity of connecting uh, people who are older, but not connected into these worlds. So it's a, it's a connection between generations in some senses, because the younger people may not have the crafts and skills and language and culture, which they're losing because of all this push at one end. And uh, these new ways of, of knowing, being, and, and doing, which uh, in, in some senses uh, that, that we have as, as younger people that's there. But we need an opening in the education space. We need spaces for this to happen. We need to have people who are, let's say, entrepreneurial enough and have enough courage to go out and set up these small force spaces to make this happen and then cluster them because nothing works better than clustering. So one of the reasons, for example, as an educational institution, it seems a little bit odd to many people, but it's pretty obvious to us. You know, when we started, and we're, we're sort of, you know, hopefully a cutting edge university, but when we started, one of the first programs that we started was our media lab, which is where the digital arts uh, and, you know, and, and, and other things come together, is precisely for this reason. Uh, the reason that we have the film festival is precisely that you can bring multiple voices together, and it's not only what you see on the screen, it is the opportunity for people working in script writing and, you know, cinematography and a whole range of things to have conversation with people who understand the content, to speak with sociologists, with you know, technologists, guys who work on urban systems, people who work on environmental questions. So that there's an exchange of, of, of ideas and ways of actually doing things in a concrete manner that will actually inf influence both the representation and the actual practice on the ground. Because one of the very practical challenges we have, and that's why you know, the, you know some of the, the exhibition that we have outside is so important. One of the big challenges that we are working on at the moment, and it's a very hard challenge uh, in Tamil Nadu, and I'll give you a concrete example there, is how to change around the systems of sanitation. And you would have seen it outside, how the sanitary workers of Mumbai live, for 30 million people. That's a problem that we have 30, 40 of our people working on for the last few years. And it's a hard question, and we're doing it in steps. It may take us 10 years to do. Because, and I'll give you, and, and the reason I'll, I'll go into something which is very, very far from the stuff that you've seen today is because they're actually connected. So the British brought to us, and the city was one of the great examples, about 150 years ago, a system of dealing with waste, uh, at least human waste, which is you take it and you flush it down. And it worked very well. In fact, for those of us who 
felt very depressed at looking at the Yamuna. Of course, things are very bad. I know that river. I actually spent time on the river in the 70s when it was relatively clean. Uh, was many of the rivers in the West, certainly in the UK, the Thames is much worse than this at one point of time. Many of the, of, of the rivers in the United States and in Europe were not as bad as this, but they were pretty bad in the 50s and 60s before the Clean Air Act was set up. Or similarly, I've seen the Danube like that in, or even other places in Poland. The thing about natural systems is, if you actually change the way that you relate to them, if you stop treating the river like a sewer instead of the place that actually gives you water and gives you life, if you, if you stop changing, treating the atmosphere as if it were a sewer, where you put all your exhaust out and your carbon into, and then you wonder why the hell you're choking to death, like in Delhi. Uh, it, you know, they, they, they re, re, the beautiful thing about natural systems is they regenerate themselves relatively quickly unless you kill them off. Unless you kill off all life because you're, you're you know, killing off an entire species, they tend to regenerate themselves. So the reason I'm, I'm making this point is the, the, the idea that you can take your waste and push it out and it can go out somewhere and nobody has to deal with it was an idea that comes from a particular culture. By and large, most cultures in this country think cyclically. People understand culturally that there's a deep connection, and that's why you could see there in the morning whether the person is going out and you know doing what is ablutions or people put out food for whatever. They see the connection between themselves and their environment. They also, very often, of course, in a very parochial manner, see a relationship between themselves and other people. It's there. There's a deep cultural tradition which is still alive. If you're able to tap into that, you're able to change practices. So one of the core things to understand is, in a system like this, is your waste goes somewhere. And if it goes back into your water supply, it doesn't matter where you're a film star or you know, you're in a fancy big house next to a slum. But if people in the slum have jaundice and the same pipeline comes to you, you can be pretty certain that you'll get jaundice pretty soon. That's the story of part of Mumbai. We're all connected in that sense. But that perception is not in people's heads. So the power of both myth, myths and storytelling is that people say, oh my God, this is what we're doing. And that's the power that we have to be able to evoke. That's what those photographs that we saw outside are so important about. So what we're trying to do in Tamil Nadu is to try and change people's way of thinking and saying, look, this is a state that's relatively rich, it's half urban, but you have no water. Historically, part of the state has been drought prone for a long time. And we know from climate, I mean, I work on this quite a lot, that over the next 15 or 20 years, you're going to get much less water. So forget about the, you know, the two, two, two tone flush, which uses it to flush more things. You don't even have that water. You'll have water every four days at that, at, at that kind of thing there. So you have to go to a, a way of dealing with human feces, which has much less water. Now you're thinking, what the hell am I talking about feces movement? But the fact is, this means a fundamental change of culture. It's a change of how we think about this process. It's also a change of how we think about who's going to deal with this stuff. Because as we know, across much of this country, most of the people who deal, deal with conservancy, I would say 95, 98% of them are Dalits. And that's what they've been consigned to be for five, 5,000 years in some senses. If we have to change the structure of our society and the system that we work in, we have to change the relationship between society and the people who are doing this work and our own behavior, whether it's washing hands or how you do or whatever it is. And that will only change if people see the connection between what they do in their everyday life, like you could see in Ahmedabad, like you could see in Rio. And I've seen what's happened in Rio. In fact, Rio is one of the cities that I've spent some time in. That connection comes from storytelling and, and mythology. And that's why this stuff is really important. If you're able to change people's perceptions of what they are, what their relationship with things are, they will change over time. It's difficult. But we have to make these fundamental and really rapid changes in our behavior, in our values, what we consider important and what's not important. It's no use the Supreme Court saying that every kid in the country has to do environmental sciences as a, you know, as a mandatory subject in class six or something like that. It has to come into our everyday lives. And that's what I think most of the people here are going to be really important. I mean, you know, art is important. But if it carries the stories that are, that, that are critical, that will enable us to reflect on who we are, what we're doing, what we're doing to ourselves, what we're doing to our environment, what we're doing to our cities, and what we're doing to our fellow citizens. And when you suddenly realize that you say, my, you know, by doing a small little thing, by changing how much water I use, it'll change the relationship between somebody 
who is consigned to life and life expectancy among the conservative workers is probably under 40 or something. So think about it. You have to get into that muck. You can only do that if you have alcohol. Most, I mean, for the men at least, women don't necessarily go inside. And then obviously, if you're going to have alcohol every day, uh, you know, your life is going to be very short, apart from all the other things that you're, 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 you're uh, exposed to. So anyway, the reason that I said this is, we have to find ways of dealing with the problems in everyday life. Uh, and laying this out, it doesn't mean that we don't pick up larger questions, they're, they're also critical. And what we try and do in this festival and other things is to make those very practical, simple connections. And people are doing that all the time. Because that's how they connect, that's how they do things. It's not only about soap operas and you know, grand ideas and you know becoming the best or the largest in the world. They are real active things that we do. And they, in, in doing that, uh, my sense is there are really different ways of actually constructing what we would want to be. It will also give people huge opportunities to not only live, live a different life, but live a better life in different ways than we've conceived it before. And I think the question of, of, of projection, of trying to understand what we were, like we saw in the great Ikta theater and the films of the 50s and 60s, which is, I mean, you know, Indian cinema is, is fantastic in some ways. We still deal with a whole range of complex questions. But that mood and that idea of how change can take place that voice, in some senses, has been lost, excepting occasionally uh, in, 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 in much of what we see in the mainstream discourse. It's fragmented. I think we need to try and dis rediscover that. And I think a lot of young people can help us do that very quickly in ways that will propagate much, much faster than they would have in, in an earlier day and age. So I guess, uh, you know, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll stop there and then we can open up a conversation. Thank you so much of what you said makes so much, I mean, it's it's evident, it's obvious to all of us. Uh, what do we do when we are faced with such blatant denial, right? I mean, with Trump, with people in our own country, uh, even, when you, even when you give evidence, even when you show, whether it's images or tell stories, um, who blatant, how do you deal with with these very obvious, yeah. I don't want to take a US example, but if I just take one for a second, basically the interesting thing that's happened on Trump and climate is, as soon as he did what he did, pull, pull out of Paris, there was a massive counter movement in the US, which is pushed back. And he's actually saying, forget it, we are going to agree with Paris in any case. You know, there are 20 states and there are about 300 cities, and I know the mayors, we have, I've been part of the process, who said, forget it, you can do whatever you want to do in Washington, we've seceded from this process. So. The thing is, you know, th there are a million mutinies in some senses that are happening in many cases. That's what subaltern processes are. Centralized systems have less and less power in today's world. And I think the idea of citizenship and territory and all that kind of stuff is changing very quickly. So that's the Trump story. But the fact is, it's exactly what you've seen that in the film in Ahmedabad. You basically go to work every day and if you can do just two simple things in, in that day, whether it's plant a tree or, I mean, I'm giving you, you know, cheesy examples or do something different. It, it is in the everyday everyday doing of things and the choices that you make uh, that, 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 that make the critical difference. You know, I mean, I, I was just somebody, of some, when we were doing this 26-11 thing, people were reflecting also on the, the earlier train blast in Bombay. And the fact that people would suddenly, you know, there were thousands of people who were giving blood. And one of them actually went up, a senior, you know, uh, official, and asked them, what are you doing? They said, look, aapka rishidar hai, to isli aap dere ho. They said, nay, we're talking about the stuff that happened in the last street. So, so there is, as I said, the connections that are important to make are, are really, so I think it's, it's in the everyday life that you find the change that's there. We have, I think, a tremendous opportunity. And we've seen other cultures go through this process. I mean, if you read the work of Dewey and people like that, they were talking about exactly this question in the early 20th century in New York. Uh, it's about citizenship and how you make those connections. We have tended to focus on fractures and differences and not on the collectives. This country is built tremendously on collectives. That's how we survive. If women didn't do the work that they were doing, you know, the whole, everything would shut down in some senses. And that's, that's a question of collective solidarity in the family, in the community. Similarly with other things. I mean, our, our national movements and all the great things that we've done that have transformed this country have come through collective action. But the narrative is all about confrontation, division, uh, and you know, you're different from me, etc. Which is okay. That's partially true in some cases, but it doesn't have to be true. 
So I would say it's in the small things that that we we can make a big difference. The big things are great and they're useful and they're nice. But if people can see really practical things in in in, in your daily life, it, you know, it makes such a simple thing not not that simple. Thank you so much. Uh, I, I'm trying to uh, frame the question if it makes sense. So uh, the the term creative economy and uh, so the fact when you were giving me that example that cities can be a great opportunity where people from different creative backgrounds can come and th that the idea of the lab, the idea of the melting pot, and uh, and I've been trying to figure out that like I moved from Delhi to Bangalore thinking that, mm -hmm. looking for that that space for that that creative minds we can do something together. But somehow, when it comes to the term economy of something sustainable, I always look towards the joint family system or the, how family economies have worked. And in my head, there's nothing common in this creative economy or these creative artists that are coming together, maybe for different reasons, for us to hold or make it to the next step. Whereas if I look at the joint family system or the the, the, the system that have been functioning for so long that have passed on over generations. Mm -hmm. So even though in my head city is the place for the, all these opportunities, I don't I'm not seeing it happening. And I'm 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 trying to figure it out. Is it because I don't see a connection to my fellow or like something is missed somewhere? Okay, I'm I'm gonna be very sharp response. So I think one of the reasons you may not have found it in Bangalore is a lot of the creativity or what we call creative stuff or the innovative stuff in Bangalore is focused on trying to make as much money as quickly as possible and retire by the age of 30. Now life unfortunately doesn't work like that and all you'll be deadly bored for the next 50 years. Uh, the challenge is most people are focused on trying to create market opportunities, do things that are faster, sharper, etc. They're not focused on dealing with the problems that are really important in this country and many of them of course are working on you know stuff that's happening abroad etc. But they are social entrepreneurs doing all kinds of stuff. The fact is that we don't have a coherent space to bring together the creative people and the social entrepreneurs in the same space. So one of the core challenges that we're trying to deal with in, 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 in uh, uh, Dhamanad is a question of public perception of what happens to what you talk. So if you don't talk about your shit, you'll never be able to address what those things are. It's like an alcoholic in some sense. No, you have to be able to accept that there's a problem there and that is a change of mindset which the creative industry does it fantastically in advertising and everything else that you have. We're getting pumped every day by 20 ads on television. But in the stuff that really matters to us, we know we're not able to breathe, we're not able to work, etc., etc. We don't have that resource. So what but the challenge that I'm laying out is let I mean they, there are enough people in a large metropolitan circumstance. You need four, five hundred people together who can make a tremendous difference if you can change things happen. But there are no spaces for that to happen. And you can't actually experience the solidarity in that process that's happening. They, they, you know, you need five locations in Bangalore where this can happen in other places. It's just, and we don't have those. It doesn't just take much money. It takes imagination to do this kind of stuff. Yeah. Just a couple of final points. I think partly why it doesn't happen is because where are those spaces and who's here? So if you look at who's here, who are you talking to? Exactly. And so if you don't bring in people who are part of the solution, so to speak, we're never going to change things. And I don't think that's easy to happen because I don't want to pick on you. I'm sorry, I don't even know you. But earlier you had uh, talked about this person and said, if you work here, you will speak in this way. And I think that's the problem. You all want to speak in a particular way that's academic, that's critical, that's Western, that's informed. And then we're going to continue that. So actually, there are lots of people in Mumbai doing different works, and actually two of them happen to be here, but they left, and they are from Koro, which is an organization that works primarily in the Bastis around Jambu, and they're working with young people, and their leadership is primarily Dalit. They came, two or three people, they, you know, not cognizant in academic language or in English, but they follow enough, and then after a while, you know, you feel alienated and you leave. So they didn't stay here for this. So I think so it's not just a matter of imagination. We've created structures and that's partially where we don't really meet what's happening to other people, what they're doing. We're not interested. As I said, most people, and I think there, I think the class element has to be brought in that it's not just about a lack of imagination. There's plenty of imagination, but we have our own privileges and the ways in which we want to see ourselves and we're not really interested. And that's where fragmentation, I think, works against 
solidarity and that we're all in our own bubbles. I mean, if people are in gated communities, they don't even have to anymore. And if you're in an Uber and Ola, you don't even see or smell and that puts you even at a greater distance and you're not necessarily interested. So I think there are structural issues. It's not just lack of imagination. And I think we can't sort of work ourselves out of those structural issues without addressing those injustices. Yeah, and exactly. And, and class is only one of those things. I would say gender and caste are absolutely as critical as in some senses. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, some of us work across those things and we speak in different languages, but yeah, you're absolutely right. No question about that. But even the people who work across those things, imagination is still a challenge because the environment is, 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 is quite complex to them. And we don't even have a vocabulary to discuss these kind of questions. But what happens when a new technology comes in and changes your perception of everything? And in fact, artists are so important in that because they're able to explore the boundaries of that, which other people in the social sciences or in actual practice have no idea about. They can see ahead in some senses. Sorry. Uh, with the fast population growth in India and the haphazard growth of uh, urbanization, I find that the solid waste management is the biggest challenge we have. And I don't see any political will in solving this. And um, I don't find that even the creative industry is not giving enough focus for this. Your views on that? Yeah, I, 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 I would agree with you. But again, the thing about solid waste is very simple. Actually, poor people produce very little waste in this country. And poor people who are working in the solid waste industry are absolutely the reason that cities are what they are at the moment. So, uh, the, the address, you know, you start the solid, addressing the solid waste challenge at the site of production, whether it's a restaurant or it's a house, it starts in your house. And if you look at solid waste, and I work on this a little bit in the, for a long period of time, the bulk of India's so-called solid waste is of two forms. One is organic stuff, which you can easily compost. Not a problem at all. I mean, if you come to Bangalore, we'll show you how we do it. In, in, in our building, in our facilities, we, we compost everything that you have. And it's great because you can recycle it and it can actually grow things, which is a big problem. The second one is actually, you know, dust and construction waste, which is quite large. And there we have a real problem because if whatever we do, we, we clean and clean out, store outside our households, or if we tear down a building, we put it in somebody else's plot. So that's a civic question which we have to deal with through, you know, fairly tight and, and, and you know, that's why our municipality is very important because it's a collective thing. If you deal with those things, then we have another big problem which is called plastic, which is a disaster now across every village in this country also. If you travel around the country, you can go to the most remote areas and you'll find a big dump of plastic on the road coming out because people can't do, do anything with that. Plastics is a little bit more complicated, but that's also to do with regulation. Some states have done quite effectively, been done, done a lot of work in dealing with these things. If you get rid of these three, then there are other stuff that's there, there's toxics and various other things. But if you get rid of these three, by and large things will work. And it's also a question of how you manage municipal governance. I'll give you, I mean, I won't take time, but I'll give you a very concrete example. Till 1980, till mid-1980s, and this happens in Mumbai. Mumbai is much better than others, so I won't take this example. In Lucknow, which is a city that many of us love to hate, it's a very it's a wonderful city. I've spent a lot of time there. There used to be street cleaning twice a day in even the most congested areas. But then the question of municipal management and caste politics and whatever it is, it went from once twice a day to once a day to once in two days. And then the lifting went to once in three days. So if as soon as you do that, it, it just doesn't work. So we have to actually actually make sure that our systems work. But one of the reasons for that is because of a whole range of creative processes in the management of these institutions and the fact that the, the living and working conditions of the people who are actually doing the clearance became horrible. So why should they invest in something which is not being able to make any difference to themselves and to their children? So the, these are things that we have to really think about. These are collective goods that the state does need to provide. It doesn't take much to do it. We have such wonderful examples. When uh, you, uh, uh, Rao went and cleaned up Surat in 1993, after that big scare about the plague there, that city has not gone back. So we can absolutely do these things. It's a question of being able to pull together both the household and the enterprise level stuff, the entire chain, and making sure the things that are public are managed. And no, so there's no confusion. If there's somebody who wants to get this done, it, it can get done. 
they are investment and other issues, but I mean, by and large, India doesn't have a problem. Our cities, the big cities don't have a problem. Smaller towns have an issue. In some cases, they don't have the people, they don't have the resources. So, I mean, I don't think this is a, this is a perception question uh, because, you know, we, we, we do understand these and, and poor people absolutely understand the question of dealing with race. So, anyway, sorry, that is a sharp technical response to your question. So, uh, it was great the way you defined the creative economy, economy as a uh, word and the kind of questions you had. So, I have two questions to ask you. One, coming from that space where we are saying, uh, if there is an, so the, the migration as a thing is very big and as we have seen that happening in the urban centers, right? And when we talk about, there are, uh, take an example of a language, which is a living language. We call it as a living language, which is also getting died over time, right? When you talk about creative or any, any form of art, when uh, a farmer or probably a set of farmers or other uh, sections of the village, uh, people are transferred to the uh, urban centers, probably in either uh, constructions or other industries, as you talked about. How do you make sure that there is a uh, uh, transition or probably a space where uh, the whole aspect of um, uh, their art is being sustained to an extent? Because it is very closely linked to the work they used to do. Probably while farming, they used to sing songs, right? So now if you go out and they are doing something else, they've totally lost, lost it, right? So when you talked about unorganized sector, right, and how to bring that into the context is what is the one question I want to have your views on. And second is where uh, we have chosen a route of trying to build urban centers in a very top-down approach, right, to an extent. At least we had attempted to go in that route. So while uh, we are looking at other cities or uh, global, like you talked about Silicon Valley, and we are uh, we try to say India, Silicon Valley is Bangalore to an extent, right? So how do you think so this approach where you say the top down, uh, is it how it is going to affect the creative economy? Is it that the creative economy of uh, in urban centers is going to grow top top down or it's going to grow up uh, bottom up? See for us, India the the, the, all solutions begin with an. You can't do this or that. You have to do both things. But first, first, first thing, I mean, there's a misperception just now, of pretty much across the country, that our urban centers are growing because of migration. That's not true. The secular trend for the last 40 years, last five censuses now, is that migration uh, migration contributes to about 20% to the increment of urban population. That's true of Mumbai. This has been an old story. We've been hearing this in the 70s. Uh, so that's a myth. The data doesn't show that at all. The basic reason that urban centers grow is because of the natural growth of urban population. Fine. So, if you, I mean, that's a fact. It's a, it's a macro fact across the country. Some places are slightly less, uh, you know, more or less, but that's a, that's a fact. So, if that is true, then part of your the response to your question is to start here. That's why I said start with the educational side, the space that's there. So, where is an opportunity for connecting to any hand-based work and cooperation in the urban, urban, the urban context? There's very little space for that to happen. And if you're able to do that at the school and build on that, whether it's, you know, there's a so-called vocational stream, otherwise you straight away have a much more fulfilled life in some senses. So the question is, you know, Gandhi started this process way back in Varda with Naitalim, but the Naitalim was developed for the village in a different economy in the idea of Khadi, etc. You need to be able to have similar imaginations and there will be a hundred of them in this country because what is going to work in Trinan Valley is not going to work, uh, you know, somewhere in Ladakh. So we have to think of ways of doing this and that's why, you know, I think some people will break through and create these processes to make, 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 make that happen. So I said, start from here. Don't think about something coming from the outside. It's useful to have that and you can see that flow back and forth, especially for people who have gone back and forth. So if you look at mill workers who are here, who during the strike went back, to parts of, you know, Maratwara, this, that, the other, you'll find that linkage back and forth. In fact, the most rooted people, in some senses, culturally are the migrants, and they, you know, that they, they have that, that living culture in, in some senses. So, look at people who are coming to the city as outsiders is a foolish idea. In any case, they're a relatively small part of the process that's there. They actually enrich what you have, right? So, I mean, you know, look at the taxi driver in, in Mumbai, who comes typically from other parts of the, of the city, and as a meme, how important the tax has been through 40 years of, of, of cinema, for example. 
So if you're able to take that and build something around it and do that not only in, you know, grand stuff that comes out on screens, you do that through street theater, you do that through a whole range of other performing arts, which are very real. People are going to come from, you know, North Bihar and X, Y, and Z. We don't necessarily have space. I mean, let's see. Uh, there are spaces that are there, but the spaces are folk and not organized, and they're not. But the, the, the power of of the social media stuff is that you can aggregate them really quickly. It just requires people who are smart enough to understand the new technology to bring that thing together to actually find this clustering, and you could find them. I mean, Bhojpuri's um, the cinema and, and and art, or even if you go to Uttarakhandi stuff that's there, all of this stuff you find in various places. The chap who's doing. Uh, in a small town who's doing the the cafe is also doing the recording is also the local videographer so there are places that they're happening but we don't recognize them and the connections are not, are not in place but i mean having recognized that the question of caste gender etc is, is is pretty important as far as it's concerned so it has to be top up and, and you know i don't want to take particular names but there are large uh, firms that are going to market at the moment which have used the craft tradition and built you know networks of a few thousand places across the country so there are ways of doing that, and there's not one. There are at least, I would say, half a dozen or, or more of these of these these enterprises that are doing that for, for particular kinds of crafts. The question is, can we do it for other things? Can we do it for music? Music is easy. It's dematerialized, no? Uh, and but the problem is that there's a hegemony of certain sets of things because, but that's a, in, in an earlier imagination. It's very easy to disrupt that, but you don't get people together with you know with. They, whatever, to, to be able to crowdsource 10, 20, 30 lakhs to get something going is actually relatively simple. Even in this country, you don't have to go outside to get it. So I think that's where the, the challenges uh, sort of lie in some senses. So if you're able to get musicians to do work in different parts of the country with different traditions and do stuff that's there, and you can break through this thing quite, quite quickly. The question then is of marketing, but then you have to have people who understand how to market and then disrupt the hegemony of the large companies that do this kind of stuff. But I mean, this this again is a question of, of trying to bring together the right sets of people and do, do things differently. So yes, it has to be bottom up. You have to have a structure. You have to have structures that enable you to do it. But by and large, if you look at innovation in the country, it's happened either outside large the large state apparatus. That's how the IT industry, BT industry, all the big things that you've done has happened, or even outside large industry. But we, as I said, the, 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 it's it's a part of this new set of things that gives us the ability to do these things. But you need to connect the dots and you need to have people who can actually build the institutions and processes to make that happen. And that's where we're stuck. And they have to have, let's say, a commitment to certain sets of values, which are not easy to find because everybody's running after uh, the next IPO. And this is the reason why Korean was very successful because he was able to do that. But it took him 30 years to do what he did. I mean, India's, one of India's great success stories is the White Revolution. And that's built on collective processes. Of course, it was built on caste, which was in a particular location, but it's gone across the country in many places. So we can do it. But it requires persistence. It requires people who are willing to do that and people who can bridge these cultures. I want to add to the ma'am. Ma'am said that there were two people came from like Chembur or कि उनके वो कैब नहीं है बट प्रमेश जी ने बोला था कि जैसे यहां पर जो काम कर रहे हैं बट हम यहां पर मैं एक साल से यहां पर आ रहा हूं लाइक uh, like, मैं अंबरनाथ से आता हूं यहां पर बट मैं कुछ सीखने मिलता है यहां पर मैं सोचता हूं कि यहां पर आ गया हूं मैं अपग्रेड होता हूं ऐसा नहीं कि, प्र, कि यहां पर जो काम करते हैं वही अपग्रेड होते हैं मैं बहुत थैंक यू प्रमेश का कि जो यहां पर गोदरेज का कि इतने अच्छे इवेंट्स रखते हैं ऐसे नहीं कि सिर्फ कि उन्होंने बोला कि वो कैब से होता है या कुछ वैसा कुछ नहीं है बट बहुत अपग्रेड मिलता है यहां पर आके जी जी और बहुत थैंकफुल हूं यहां पर और ऐसा कुछ और ये क्वेश्चन था कि जस्ट मैं जब भी मैम ने बोला तो मुझे करेज मिला कि हां भाई ऐसे नहीं कि सिर्फ इंग्लिश में बोल सकते हैं जब भी अभी मैंने ये जमुना पार्क के जो डायरेक्टर हैं यहां बैठे इनसे भी क्वेश्चन मगर आई डोंट हैव दैट करेज की जब तक क्योंकि ये जो मैं आप मेरी अपग्रेडिंग है जैसे मतलब मैं बोल नहीं मतलब वो करेज नहीं था मेरे पास जब जब भी मैम ने बोला तभी मेरे में करेज आया कि हां मैं बोल सकता हूं कि हां भी जरूरी नहीं है बहुत थैंक यू वो मैम का कि जो उन्होंने बोला और इन्होंने बोल आपने बिल्कुल ठीक कहा पर हम ये कह रहे हैं कि 
इस शहर में जैसे मतलब पचास वार्ड है पचपन वार्ड है हर वार्ड में आपको दो तीन ऐसे अड्डे चाहिए जिसमें देश के हर बाग के लोग आएंगे हाँ और ये नहीं कि मतलब देश की इस तरफ से हमें ये भी चाहिए कि लोग जो है जो नॉर्थ ईस्ट के लोग हैं वो भी आएंगे बिकॉज वो भी हिंदी मतलब अरुणाचल जाएंगे तो हिंदी वो हमसे अच्छे बोल रहे, बोल लेते हैं और नागामीज जो है यू हैव टू बिल्ड दोज कनेक्शन पर वो अड्डा नहीं है बिकॉज ये ये शहर जो है इसमें इस देश के विदेश के कितने सारे लोग हैं पर वो अड्डे मिलते ही नहीं है हम मतलब इनको जो है मेरा जो चैलेंज है कि कैन वी क्रिएट द स्पेसिस नॉट लाइक दिस बिकॉज यहाँ पे आने के लिए आपको ये क्या क्या है ये एक्सेस कार्ड चाहिए तो एक्सेस पहले बिल्डिंग को देख के लोग कहेंगे भैया तो आ, आने सकते उसके बाद एक्सेस पास आप कह रहे हैं कि बोलने की दिक्कत होती है एक्सेस पास लेने में पहले एक्सेस पास होता क्या है या नहीं नहीं होता ये बड़ी बहुत बड़ी बात होती है ठीक है ना तो आई मीन मैं आपकी बात बिल्कुल समझता हूँ बट क्वेश्चन इज दिस वी आर ऑल आजकल इंटरनेट ने जो है काफी जो है ये चीजें जो है ना जो जरूरी है वो उसने तोड़ दिया है बट अंत में हमारी और आप आ, आपकी जो है आमने सामने की बात जो है इज वेरी क्रिटिकल उसके बिना जो है आगे बढ़ना बड़ा मुश्किल है आपके नाम का मतलब मुझे पहले जानना है ठीक है चलो मैं परिचय देता हूँ आपको ठीक है बस वही था आपका नहीं, प्रश्न वो पहली चीज उसके आई हैव गॉट टू ऑब्जर्वेशन टू शेयर विथ यू ऑल First, I understand that city is our functional representative of our state and nation, of course. And now we say the globe. We all have become global citizens, indeed. We have increase in numbers. We have increase in references. That is most important thing. वो bridge कम नहीं हो रहा है. Numbers बढ़ रहे हैं, लेकिन आपस की जो दूरी है ना, वो कम नहीं हो रही है, because number of differences are also increasing. second point i wanted to share with you is uh, as a city is a uh, city uh, people we look forward to villages ki gaon jana hai wahan ja ke purani yaade dekhni hai but we are losing that village content also i am from kokan okay i i come from guhagar which is a nature bahut acha hai wahan ka nisarga saundarya bahut acha hai but when i go back to my village i don't see cow जो गोठा बोलते हैं हम लोग यहाँ काउजा के दैट इज नॉट देयर इन द सिंगल हाउस होल्ड द वाइट रेवोल्यूशन वॉट वी आर टॉकिंग अबाउट इन गुजरात हैज बिकम अ कोऑपरेटिव काइंड ऑफ एक्टिविटी बट जो घर का जो इंटीग्रल पार्ट था दैट वी हैव लॉस्ट ओके सेकेंडली द कंटेटमेंट ऑफ पीपल समाधान बोलते हैं हम लोग मुझे सेटिस्फैक्शन हुआ वो लेवल बहुत कम हो गया एंड ऑल दीज थिंग्स एडेड अप सम After having everything, also nobody seems to be that level of happiness or index. Us vajah se bada nahi hai. So probably when we are creating different things, this could be one of the aspects that can be highlighted. After all, ye sab karke humko happiness hi. We want to achieve that happiness, you know. So somewhere that index, how it can be increased by different type of creative ways. And thank you very much for your. बढ़िया तो आपका जो पहला प्रश्न है मेरा नाम जो है ये मलबार से है नॉर्थ केरला से इट्स अ हिस्टोरिकल नेम इट्स अ क्वाइट एन ओल्ड नेम सो इट्स नॉट इट डजेंट मीन एनीथिंग इट्स अ नेम ऑफ अ पर्सन हु इज गेटिंग टू लॉट ऑफ ट्रबल इन द एट सेंचुरी सो आई आई एम टेलिंग टू द सेम थिंग मे बी अ फ्यू थाउजेंड इयर्स लेटर सो दैट्स मतलब उसका परिचय उस तरफ से है अबाउट द अदर क्वेश्चन दैट यू हैव द थिंग इज दिस दैट in a global world the village will never remain the village the point is the village also has lots of problems so this is an old conversation ye 70 80 saal se chal raha tha i mean if you could bring in in fact nobody ever made a film like this you need a monavai kind of film for people to understand this the conversation that happened between gandhi ji pandit ji and ambedkar it never really happened but it happened in you know in their political engagement with each other where gandhi was saying what we actually believe india's constitution is built on this our, our psyche is built on this ki gaon mein sab kuch acha hai aur gaon mein matlab jitna hum rahenge utna theek hoga that's partially true but the other reality is that gaon mein shoshan bahut hota hai bahut inequality hai and it's institutionalized so there are many good parts to it but there are also some terrible parts to it which is why baba sahab said ki bhai sahab aap wahan se chhod ke aa jao shehar aur shehar mein kuch 
मतलब अलग अलग तरह की आपको अपॉर्चुनिटीज मिलेंगे और शायद कुछ बदलेगा इट्स नॉट ओनली इकोनॉमिक डेवलपमेंट इज आल्सो द क्वेश्चन ऑफ यू नो ऑफ 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 सोशल डेवलपमेंट एंड 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 द ट्रांसफॉर्मेशन दैट इज नॉट एक्चुअली वर्क इटसेल्फ आउट इन मेनी केसेस स्पेशली एज़ फार एज़ आवर पॉपुलेशंस हु कम फ्रॉम विद इन कोर्ट्स ट्राइबल एरियाज बट दैट्स द अदर थिंग एंड देन पंडित जी वाज सेइंग कि शहरों को बनाओ ये करो वो करो बट द फैक्ट इज यू नो दैट दैट डिबेट इज स्टिल अ रियल डिबेट एट द मोमेंट बट द फैक्ट is that with so many people who are there we have the opportunity of keeping a balance between some elements of the rural culture but you cannot tell somebody in a village today ki aapke bacche theek tarah se nahi padhenge kyunki school nahi chalega aur aapka pani nahi hoga kyunki aap gaon mein hain aur kisan jo hai pure desh ko khana khilayega you seen this it happened in mumbai a few months ago it happened in delhi two weeks ago ye log koi sunne wala nahi hai and that's because it's a serious agrarian crisis i work on this question with people across the country and it's very 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 bad 60% 60% of our farm families are in some form of debt so people are not committing suicide out of nothingness but obviously people don't do that unless there's something really serious so this is a very serious crisis there are very good things that we have culturally at least that we shouldn't lose but that doesn't mean that people live in difficult circumstances and are poor for the next five generations वो तो लोग सुनने वाले नहीं होंगे इट्स नॉट दैट्स नॉट पॉसिबल सो वी हैव टू फाइंड सम इंटरेस्टिंग बैलेंस देयर एंड आई थिंक यू नो इन कोंकण गोवा एटलीस्ट ऑन दिस कोस्ट वी हैव सम आइडियाज ऑफ हाउ टू डू इट केरला इज वन एग्जांपल ऑफ हाउ यू कैन गो बट एनीवे वो तो लंबी बात हो गई एज फार एज दैट्स कंसर्न द क्वेश्चन ऑफ 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 सेटिस्फैक्शन एंड हैप्पीनेस दिस इज अ डीप फिलोसॉफिकल क्वेश्चन इन सम सेंसेस आई विश आई कुड आंसर इट बट द फैक्ट इज No, no. I'm just saying the the fact is that we need to make the connections with everyday life, and I think that's the part of the storytelling that we we we're, we're making a connection. And it's with very very pragmatic things. You know, what do you choose to eat? Your choice. And and this is a, you made a very good point there about the green revolution. The green revolution has done lots of uh, sorry the the white revolution has done very good things. It also has terrible consequences that we don't recognize. You know, the growth of BGH and what you consume in terms of your milk. It's creating a lot of problems for many of us. Same thing, the Green Revolution gave us, but but just a, but a million tons. So, like, our country's food grain production now 250 tons has gone up. It's a huge change, but it's also given us the diabetes and the cardiovascular disease epidemic that we are facing today. So, you know, we have to think a little bit ahead in what we're doing. So, it's not only we, you know, we'll do well and somebody will have a nice house and. You know, whatever a car and all those kind of things. Those things are not possible for us to all do. So asking some basic questions is important. If you're not happy, then you know it doesn't help very much. But there are different things that make different people happy, and different things that make different generations happy also. We have to be very clear about that. So we can't force our way out. Sorry, we're getting into all kinds of interesting territory now. <laughs> Maybe you want to see the film. I can just shut up. <laughs> चर्चा बहुत हुई Maybe I just want to uh, share a cartoon that has been uh, uh, done by Nala Ponappa. It actually very beautifully illustrates what you said. Do those small things. There is an adult holding a globe, saying "Save the planet." The little child girl, she is holding a plant and say, saying "Don't save the planet. Save the uh, save the plant." It's exactly, you know, actually, yeah. We said that in our report, which has gone around the world. You got to plant more trees, put more carbon into the soil. Yeah, absolutely. Small things make a big difference. Shall we? Shall we do something interesting now? Yeah. <laughs>